Well, it's getting to be that time of the year again, where speculation about the successor to the Nintendo Switch is starting to go around, and wouldn't you know, there are Chinese factory prototypes that are being leaked all over the internet, but curiously, they, they don't look that different to the existing Switch in, well, any way, really. Uh, it might be a little thinner. Maybe a little. Maybe. Maybe a little. But uh, for the purposes of going forward for the rest of this video, I want to make it clear that we're going to be calling this the Nintendo Go uh, instead of the Switch 2. I just think it's going to get confusing because I'll forget to say 2 and then people are going to say, wait, the Switch doesn't do that. And it's okay because I just want to make it clear what I'm talking about. Why am I calling it the Nintendo Go? Do I know something you don't know? No, I do not know if the Nintendo Go is what they're going to call it. It just seems like something clever that they would do. It sounds nice. The Nintendo Go, now with Mario Kart 8. Go online with your friends. That kind of clever wordplay stuff. They, they tend to play with that. It's the Wii and Wii U kind of stuff, the thinking with that. And so, for the purposes of the video going forward, when I say uh, Nintendo Go, when I say Nintendo Go, what I'm talking about is the successor of the Switch, what is searchable as the Switch 2. I just want to make sure that I get things clear about which one I'm talking about, because there's going to be an important separation here in a couple minutes, okay? So, if you're unaware, the Switch itself is coming sort of to a uh, pretty drawn-out end here. Uh, Nintendo, for a while now, has not had an, uh, like an upward-facing, I guess, outward-facing uh, plan for what to do with a successor, uh, where Xbox and PlayStation just seem to like jacking up the... Uh, graphics quality, making things shinier, I guess. Uh, they're in a war to transform their consoles into gaming PCs, I guess. But uh, Nintendo, on the other end, has been sort of embarking on a journey of making sure that still your family and friends who have no idea what a Mario is, somehow, can play a game about Mario and not be too lost in the process. Which I can appreciate as a guy that, you know, someday I want to have a family and, you know, little kids aren't going to be able to keep up with Halo right out of the gate. They're going to need something to, you know, get them started. And the Switch and, you know, the Wii and the Wii U, these were all nice products for easy access for kids that didn't need like a, a tutorial on what everything did. It was sort of, you know, it was intuitive. You could figure out what everything did. There's only a limited amount of, of stuff you could do with the controller until it started telling you to move it around to create different effects. So it's kind of that that reasoning, like back with the original Nintendo machines, where there were only so many buttons, meaning there were only so many different actions you could take as a player to create a reaction. So that's just that's just a little like me noticing things kind of uh, trivia. I don't know if your brain noticed it, but it, my brain did, where Nintendo is still working on the premise that you don't need a mountain of experience to get in to be able playing these things. And that, that, I, I think that's needed. You know, you could still have these guys out here like Xbox and PlayStation chasing these crazy experiences. But there's always like the Nintendo experience of like, hey, grandma's not going to be keeping up with AAA gaming forever. Eventually, she's going to fall behind. And we here at Nintendo think it would be perfectly fine to have a system that she could just pick up and play despite having no idea how it works. So... I think that's a smart idea. So, going on with that, I want to uh, bring your attention to this new thing. According to Gizmodo Japan, this is originally wrote, wrote by Katayama uh, Makoto, all right? This would be uh, Makoto Katayama, in, as the English pronunciation name goes, I believe. And so, this was just uh, back on the 24th here. And now, is Nintendo developing devices other than the Nintendo Go? Okay? Now... I believe that they are venturing into VR with this, okay? Now, here's why. They registered a patent for a, a 24 gigahertz millimeter wave sensor that can detect objects around the device. Now, to give, be a bit more specific, over here on uh, thevideogamer.com, they provided a picture of what was filed for a patent. Now, of course, it's very basic. It obviously will not look like that when it comes out. It'll probably be stylized to, you know, if you're into Pokemon, you could get a Pokeball that tracks your movement, right? And so that's what this does. The purpose of this device is similar, if not, I think, almost identical to what the HT Vive Wave system does, okay? So this system 
doesn't necessarily need a hand uh, held controller. So like when you're playing VR, you've got those portable joysticks that have triggers and buttons and all this neat stuff so you can move your fingers in VR. Well, the Wave decided that's a little ridiculous. So they decided you could do fully independent, apart from the headset, uh, VR interaction, provided you had these wristbands to track your movements. What it appears to be that Nintendo has filed for here, from what I understand, now I, again, I went and I read up on how these things function. It's not anything special. Nintendo's not breaking the mold here. What it appears to be is they're trying to create a in-house HT Vive environment, meaning you'll have your Mario branded uh, VR headset, basically. All right. Now, again, this will move on into the next part here because here it is. Here is the head uh, helmet mounted display uh, capable VR mixed reality uh, headset that they have just recently filed uh, a patent for. And so here it is right here, uh, approved patent rather over here on October 2nd, just yesterday. We have uh, Nintendo filing for a patent for their uh, helmet uh, display, helmet mounted display capable VR and AR mixed reality headset. So you can see it's a box, right? This is a dummy image. This is what happens when they file for things that they haven't filed for a patent on the shape of it yet, hasn't been decided. And you remember Google Glasses, right? They were just regular glasses you wore on your face and they had like an augmented reality screen over here and it didn't work too great. It was a little goofy, right? And so imagine, if you will, um, the, uh, you have this Apple Vision situation going on where you have these huge ski goggles on your face, right? That's excessive. Not a lot of people are going to want to sit around having ski goggles on their face all day and then like all the moisture trap in there, even with the fans and stuff. It doesn't matter. You've got this thing pressed into your face all the time. That's been a huge kind of uh, hiccup for like having young players involved with the VR environment as well is because it's a little difficult to get a VR headset that fits a kid and then also to have it keep it on because it is a bit annoying having that thing sitting on your face like that or having the straps on top of your head all the time. So my theory is, is the reason why this is so, and this is a theory, I am not, no one has called me, no one said, hey, Cider, let's get some insider info here. I'm going to give you some insider information from Nintendo. No, what it looks like is that the, uh, the Nintendo Go is going to be uh, focused on having a party experience, as always with Nintendo. But this is more in line with anybody with the glasses can participate. It has an augmented reality function. So while you're also participating in a virtual reality situation, right, a virtual reality environment, the augmented reality is still broadcast in front of you. So you're not walking into the television, tripping over the coffee table, punting the dog out the window. You know, you're, <laughs> you're going to be able to see everything in front of you as opposed to being in this closed off environment trying to play a game and not like whack your hip into your desk. And so that, I think that's what they're doing here is you're going to get your Mario glasses, okay? Get your Mario glasses. And these are going to be like actual, do you remember the 3D glasses you went in and, and the movie theaters had for you like back when that was a big thing? I don't know if it still is. I fell out of it. I'm one of those people that ducks <laughs> when the movie, the 3D movie thing throws at you. I'm one of those people that's like, ah! <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that's why I don't enjoy it. I don't like being at the movie theater and having things thrown at me. Call me crazy. But anyway, so this is going to work on probably a similar technology to what was done with the home version of that. Remember 3D TV when that was going to be a thing? We were going to have Ray Romano just showing up in your house in the middle, like in your lap, just watching Ray Romano on TV, misaligned. All of a sudden, good old Ray's giving you a lap dance. Yeah. 3D television, very bad idea. But not so bad with video games. So you have these, you know, sunglasses, probably a little more graduated than that. They'll be a little heavier, but may have a strap in the back too, kind of like a cyclist's goggles that look more like sunglasses, but instead of having a, uh, uh, like the arms that reach back like sunglasses do, the arms here, they have like a strap across the back that connects the lenses, you know, it's sort of like steampunk goggles, you know, they may even look like that. They may even kind of be light up -y and have that kind of neat thing going on there. And again, so this is meant to track also your pitch direction and your yaw. All right. So if you're familiar with 3D warfare from any of your uh, ace combat games, the yaw and pitch, you know, and it's just very normal, very normal stuff. It has an onboard processor. 
I think that's in the article here. Nope, didn't put the picture in. So it has an onboard processor, just very normal stuff for a VR headset. But again, this can't, this doesn't have to be a gigantic thing anymore. You can have a two-piece system. And we saw this with the Wii and the Nunchuck situation. All right, and we know that the, the Nintendo Go has filed for having these magnetic clips that attach back to the screen because they're not going to abandon that from the Switch, okay? So the Go is going to feature that and have like a, a magnetic clip-in function, which, again, when you're dealing with VR, who wants to try and find out where like the little like channel is to lock your, your Joy-Con into? You just, doink, there, it's magnet connected to something. <laughs> when I get these goggles off, I'll be able to verify. But... Again, dealing with this more augmented reality function as opposed to full VR, as I think that's what they're going for. So you'll be having more of a party in your living room as opposed to being in your living room and attending a party on Mars. You know what I mean? And so, I, again, more Nintendo-y, really. It's more family-oriented than trying to get you in the Master Chief's helmet. They're trying to get you into Mario World yourself, so you can play golf with Mario and Peach as opposed to being in Mario World. They're bringing it to you. Now, I want to go back in time for a minute, though, because Nintendo filed for a rather unique um, system of screen connection management, if you will. So this was way back seven years ago, way over here on Reddit. Ha ha, Reddit, right? So way back on Reddit, they reported on this. And this was Nintendo uh, had a plan to connect all of these screens together. Um, so it's like a, uh, this was a little early, sorry. So this screen right here, as you can see, I'm trying to bring up the, there it is, Arts Technica. So here it is. So what would happen is, is that you'd set your screen next to this other one to connect over, and then you'd use your finger, and you would tell the screen which way you wanted it to extend. So rather than it assuming that you were going to now make a long chain of uh, Shreks all looking to the right at the same time, uh, you need to tell it that that's what it, where the screen is supposed to track through, okay? And so this technology would allow you to have a four-player screen with your friends. You remember that when you would go over and like break out the N64, GameCube, perhaps the Wii, the Wii U, you know, depending on what you get up to. But four-player screen, but everybody's screen, their own independent switch is their own uh, readouts. You're not getting Jimmy's readout on your screen. You know, and Jeff's over here, everybody's own switch. They all connect together, make a bigger screen, but their individual UI is their own individual UI pertaining to their screen. So again, makes party games with your friends a lot more interesting and also encourages players to have more interactions with people outside of their living room. Nintendo, again, encouraging people to go outside and touch grass, but don't forget your hardware. <laughs> but I think this is probably another interaction too with the VR function because we'll go down here and we'll take a look at this image right here. Now you see what happens is that let's imagine you have your your augmented reality goggles on, right? Your your Mario augmented reality goggles. Then you create this um three screen setup here where you've got like a w the walls and the ground there and then the other wall opposing walls. So now you have like a, a game environment. And then an augmented reality function projects uh, sprites into that screen in a 3D function while you can touch the screen to move the environment around with them. So you've seen these 3D painter situations, right? Where you put on your VR goggles, your virtual painter, and you go in there and you just make these gigantic things in VR, this null void environment. Well, imagine rather than having just this blind feet, no feedback thing, just waving your hand in the air kind of stuff so it doesn't really give you the sensation of tactile feedback as you're creating, you can now draw in a 3D environment using these three screens together and a stylus. And that allows you to cross over these environments while communicating in the augmented reality studio. So while you're decorating in 3D, you're getting the function and for, uh, the functional feeling of a, uh, a haptic feedback, I guess, your, your tactile sensation of drawing, of commanding a pen, as opposed to just waving this thing through the air and hoping Picasso comes out, you know, hoping something like Da Vinci comes out of waving your hand around in the air. And I'm sure there are people who have become very adept at using these things, but again, Nintendo trying to work on what you and I know and have a sort of good mastery of now, 
making that into a party game and building on that technology to be, you know, augmented reality you can touch. Call me crazy, but I think that's what this is going to do. Now, we'll go back in time even further. You understand, too, that out there in the wild world of video games, they go and they create different control schemes, right? So you've heard of, like, controller mapping and things like that. So way back in 2014, way back about 10 years ago, Nintendo filed for a patent that would allow you to create a freeform screen. Now, we're, we've seen these around all the time, your circular uh, LCD screens is perfectly fine. This is a touch screen. We have that now, smart watches, all that neat stuff. But this would allow you to have also a full like live interactive display with it that would allow you to custom, uh, custom, customize the buttons, right? Your interaction points. As you can see here, it's labeled through. Well, you could customize it. Ooh, yes, very nice flaming buttons, iguana that's being attacked by several suns. Very clever. But as you can see, you can label the controls for your interactive uh, environment, right? So if you want to remind people this is the jump button today, you put a little tag next to that, and your little character goes, over here, I need to jump, and that thing. So independent of what you're playing, like think of the DS, right? Imagine the DS screens, okay? But now that is on the screen and in front of you at the same time. So it's a little different, integrated with your VR. All right, so here's the third level to this. They have to show you that the control scheme has changed. Here's the invisible controller. <laughs> I don't have anything to hold at the moment. I, mm. So uh, the invisible controller, if you will. And so what would happen is, is that you'd get into a VR game and it would say, hey, we need to remind you that this is the button to go forward. Time and time again, you're watching live streams. Maybe you're into the Geeks and Gamers um, Mario Kart streams and you'll hear people like, man, I forgot the buttons. I forgot the buttons. Which button does that? Whereas this control would tell you that right then and there. It would either sense it or you could just ask it straight out. And it would be able to show you right on the screen rather than having to bring up a very annoying tutorial right in front of you that says, hey, idiot, by the way, if you wiggle waggle this thing, the car goes faster. You know, something stupid like that. Instead, the control will simply say that to you. And we already know that it has an audio interface. All of these controllers have audio interfaces to send and receive audio, all right? So you can have a speaker right there that communicates to you directly either through your VR headset, right? Your headphones with your VR headset or just outright the little speaker on board. And that looks to be what they're up to with this. Now, it got so serious before the Switch came out that they actually built the patent for it. They actually built a real you know, real deal. Take a look. It's the same thing. Da-da, da-da, controllers, uh, overly squishy de doodad thing, and then ta-da, confidential property. There it is. Look at that button right there, button right there, oval controller doodad. So again, imagine you have your, your Joy-Con from your Switch. That's a normal Joy-Con for a Switch, right? Very normal, standard Joy-Con. And imagine, though, that rather than having a just solid plastic facing on it, it had a, a screen that did the uh, fog over thing. So when it was inactive and you weren't, you, were, you weren't meant to be interacting and pushing buttons and doing interaction things, you hit a, hit a lock mechanism. But rather than going black like that on the front face, it went to whatever color you set it to. So it had a lock screen, an active lock screen. Perhaps it's an animated lock screen like you have on your phone, a motion wallpaper, if you will. I don't know. I, I think that, that they're, gonna, they're combining all of this in together because finally they have the technology to do it all. And that appears to be what they're doing with the Switch, excuse me, the uh, Nintendo Go. See, I'm screwing it up because it's hard to keep them apart. So the Nintendo Go, and this again, encourages people to be more interactive with the device than actually interactive with maybe the game head on, or perhaps the game has a more physical interaction quality to it. And this, you know, I'm talking about Google Glasses, like their goggles, this sort of thing, and they still talk about having a processor on board. So I don't know, maybe you have a nunchuck that connects over on like your shirt or something, or it has a wrist-mounted connection point and the processor is wireless that communicates to the headset. I don't know. I can't imagine head, uh, Nintendo putting out this huge thing right there, this massive face piece, you know. It seems a bit much, so... You'll have to let me know what you think down in the comments below, but this is what I've been able to piece together so far. This whole video is speculation on all of it, by the way. I don't have it insider. There's nobody ringing me up to tell me what's going on in Nintendo headquarters. None of that. 
I'm just noticing a trend and trying to connect the dots with what I understand to be the technology they already have in their wheelhouse and have patented before. So it would appear to me that this is what they're going for with the Nintendo Go. All right. Again, I don't know if that's the real name or not, but you'll have to let me know what you think about all this down in the comments below. And as always, guys, good luck out there.